When the water temperatures start warming up in the Great Lakes, that's when the smelts start running. And that's when the anglers get out in the water with their dip nets. Why, there's all kinds of methods that anglers use to dip smelt in the spring. We're going to show you some of them, and we're going to show you some great catches of smelt. But that's not all. We have a terrific smelt recipe. Oh, you're going to love it. So stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. Yeah, one little one. See, I'm not doing too bad here, Oak. See? That's enough here. That's a mess of smelt. Some pretty good ones in there, too. So that's my trophy. That's for the trophy book. Well, that's not quite big enough, but 11 inches is the minimum for a Stroh's Fishing Award for smelt. Now, it is possible to catch smelt on hook and line, but the most popular way is netting in the spring in April when the smelt make their spawning runs up the small creeks that lead into the Great Lakes. A lot of people dip along the Great Lakes shoreline like we're doing here off Au Gray. The smelt follow the shoreline to reach the creeks and you can dip them in the shallow water. An inner tube and a laundry tub, hey, that's a great way to carry your smelt as you go. Tying a bucket around your waist is convenient in some ways, but after you get it half full of smelt, you'll wish you had an inner tube. I hear Tim Farrigan from Langsburg makes a good haul. He's using a cone-shaped metal net, actually an older style, but the metal mesh has become more popular than the nylon or cloth because it's more durable. Scooping just over the bottom takes most of the smelt because they travel right over the top of the gravel. That's the way it's done in open water. Now here's another style of smelt dipping, the way they do it off the piers of Tawa City. A drop net is set on the bottom. When you see the smelt swimming over it, hoist it up, dump the smelt into your bucket, and reset the net. This might not look like an exciting way to dip smelt, but it really is. See, the smelt are swimming along the shoreline. They come to the break wall and follow it. You can see the school coming your way by the other people oh, yeah. lifting their nets coming ahead of right you. It's really sort of exciting. Oh, they're coming inside. There they are. Yeah, you got a few. Everybody's after them. They coming down here? Oh, they went right over your net there, ma'am. Well, she got a couple. Hey, everybody's got them here. <laughs> now, doesn't that look like fun? It's not an expensive pastime. It's done after dark, but you have to be there when the smelt are in. We're talking about the next few weeks. If the smelting is slow, it's not all bad. Lots of people to talk to, and it's relaxing. Now, that's how it's done at Tawas off the pier in shallow water. But smelting is also done off piers and break walls along deep water. Here we are at Port Huron with Larry Lixey. Okay, now you probably this has got to kill your arms after about an hour of dipping with this. No, it don't. It you will see. Let's see. Let's see the technique. You see, dip with the current. So all you got to do is put the net in the water and it will go for you. Just go like that. Now, are you, can you feel the bottom or not? Oh, no, the, the bottom is about 30 feet deep here. This net isn't going to get us hardly any smelt tonight because they're right on the bottom. The only guys who are getting any smelt are the guys using the drop nets. Well, this has got to build your muscle something fierce. <laughs> no, it, you'll see, it, it's, there's not really, the current takes it for you. All I got is one hand and it just goes by itself. Mm -hmm. Well, when I tried it, it really wasn't as difficult as it looks, but don't let me oversell it either. It is work. Larry Lixie has 18 footers like this made from bamboo, which he sells at his mm. bait shop. And he also Not makes myself. drop no. nets for this 30 foot water. Work. Now, do you have to pull it up fast? Probably Faster helps. The better. Faster the better, okay. Now, did we get any smelt? We did! Look at that! Hey, Bob! Look at this! <laughs> well, yeah, it's a start. Here, Interesting yeah. nets, aren't they? Designed for the fast current of the St. Clair River. And here's the proof they do catch smelt. There we go. Here they are, Bob. <laughs> yes, sir. Sure, it's a lot of work for just two smelt, but you have to start someplace. And they do put up quite a battle once you get them out of the net. Now here is what a good haul looks like. Been lucky, isn't that here? I don't see this is the there Oh, there There's was one. Oh, oh, look at this. Oh, right. we're cleaning up right now. Yeah, look at that. Oh, don't 
You don't want to tell Look anybody, do you? No, no. Be down here with their nets. Look at that. Well, OJ, some nice ones. Cameraman OJ Upatniex has seen all kinds of smelt action with us over the years, and most of the time, a net full like this would be considered a great dip. Now, these are nice smelt, but for some real action, let's leave the long-handled nets and baskets and head for the Upper Peninsula. That's where we find Pete Berger from Manistique Scaling Smelt. That's right, the smelt he keeps up there are big enough to scale. He has a pattern of quickly knocking off the scales, then their heads, then he picks up a smaller fillet-type knife to slit them up the bellies. Getting the right knife for the right job is important in the outdoors, just as using the right spoon is important. That's what Pete uses to remove the entrails. A serrated grapefruit spoon works well. He drops the clean smelt into a bucket of ice-cold water to clean him off, then takes his top piece of newspaper and throws it away. It's a great technique for cleaning all kinds of fish. So where does Pete Berger dip these big smelt? Broad daylight and little creeks that lead to northern Lake Michigan. A lot of people don't know that smelt run during the day, but to catch them, you have to find a creek that doesn't have any dippers already working. The smelt see you coming and they scatter. Didn't get as many as I thought they would, but they're really wild now. They're all going, we're chasing them all up there where Bob is. There must be a little gum up there. That's just the way they were when we come in. Mm -hmm. They're wild, they're swimming both ways. They're pretty as many going downstream as up. If there are too many people dipping in a creek, the you smelt will turn there. back and wait for darkness, which is why most smelt dipping in the lower peninsula is done at night. Now watch how the smelt react to peat walking upstream. Jumbo well, you can find the jumbos during the day in the UP, also in the lower peninsula, if nobody else is dipping. A variety of nets and techniques and locations and recipes makes these little smelt a big April attraction in Michigan outdoors. <music>Seems like every time I taste a new smelt recipe, Kathy, like Kenneth Netchies from Lansing, he's sending smelt crunch. It, it, it has become my favorite smelt recipe of 1988. <laughs> Each new one is a favorite. That's right. And this one is different. Um, we want to fillet these little smelt here. Now, who's it? Does he call for that, or is yes. that something you do? No, no, well, I do it too, but yes, he called for that. It's got your beer and eggs, Hungarian paprika, which is hotter than most paprika, and cornmeal, which I think really adds to this. It stays good and crunchy going to make a batter out of the cornmeal and flour. Well, and this is a, a standard fish type of uh, batter then. So far it is, yep. And your eggs and then your beer. And like I say, the Hungarian paprika is hotter than a lot of the paprikas. Mm -hmm. and you don't want to add a lot of beer, just enough to make it um, so it's moist. You don't want it real dry. And there's your Hungarian paprika. And that stuff really, you can even see it's even redder mm -hmm. than our paprika. And it's considerably hotter. You don't want to use as much as you would of ours. And, and there's can, those smelt with the backbones out. Now, yes. I, don't, I don't go to that trouble. I just crunch right through them if they're cooked, you know. <laughs> yeah, you can. Some people but, just don't like it, I guess. Yep, and the batter is quite thick here, and I was kind of surprised at how it stayed on the smelt. But it stays very well on the smelt. And just cook them until they're golden brown. Then make a sauce out of sour cream and onion and a little bit of lemon juice. Hmm. And that's different. It's um, rather than your cocktail sauce. The big question everybody has, Bob Garner, is, is for you, are smelt too little to fool with? No, no, oh, no, no, <laughs> no. You just, they're just, I just consider them bite-sized morsels, that's all. <laughs> this, hey, and this, this is a grand way to eat smelt. Hey, I could eat smelt this way, breakfast, uh, lunch, dinner, anything. You know, the breading is prominent, isn't it, Kat? Oh, it, it definitely is. Mm -hmm. And... I yeah. like it. Oh. I like that corn. This this is my favorite fried method. It's of not a real smelt. greasy. It, it's it's excellent on smelt. You want a crazy idea? What to do with this? A little bit of maple syrup. I mean, real maple syrup. You don't just like the sour little, cream and onion. Oh, I love the sour cream and onion. <laughs> but I'm just thinking with the but the but the batter on it and everything. Mm -hmm. And I like fish in the morning corn anyway. It'd be perfect. Corn perfect. Syrup, yep. Eggs. Oh, the amazing thing about this, Bob, is that Kathy cooked this up last week, froze it, thawed it out, heated it in the microwave. 
And, it and is I don't a, think there's another breading that would stay on the fish like this one did. This what is a deal. superb, superb. <laughs> what a deal. Boom. Mm. When were fishing reels first used? A Chinese painting of a fisherman using a rotten reel dates from at least 1255 AD. But there is some evidence that reels were used as early as the 3rd or 4th century AD. Fishing reels may have been based on the early use of a bobbin in the making of silk. Spring is the time for big crappies like Gail Dransfield from Brighton is holding. Caught it at 5.30 in the morning on minnows from Long Lake in Branch County. That big one weighed a pound and three quarters. Gary Yonkers from Portage caught this 37-inch, 16-pound steelhead trout from Lake Michigan off Berrien County. And from the east side, Tim Weiserkowski from Alpena caught this 9-pound, 29-inch walleye in Lake Huron off Presqueo County while he was trolling for salmon. Now looking towards bass season, Herman Magon from Reed City gets us psyched up with a 7-pound, 4-ounce largemouth that he caught on a plastic worm, Haymarsh Lake, Macosta County. Mike Fazell from Burton bagged a 15-point opening day buck last fall from Schoolcraft County in the UP. A 19-inch spread gives this 15-pointer a score of 34, 202 pounds dressed. In the turkey category, this 10 and a quarter inch beard on the 19 pound gobbler taken in Midland County gives Dick Haller from Coleman a spot in the trophy book. And at the top of the heap at our hunting banquet was David Powers from Ross Common. His gobbler had an 11 and a half inch beard, and the day he took it, it snowed. April 21st, it snowed? It, it snowed up there. I was up by Fairview. It turned cold that night before. And they quit talking. I was hunting on one ridge, and across the pond, uh, he talked for about an hour, but wouldn't come in. So at dinner time, I decided to move across the pond on a ridge. And at 3 o'clock, I was leaning back, and I set up behind my, my blind, and there he was at my decoy. He had ne never spoke to me all day. Snuck in on you, huh? Snuck in on me. But you fooled him. Yeah. Did you eat him? No. Oh, yes. I've got, four, I've got four out of five years. Four out of five years. Well, congratulations. That's why he's got the biggest one here this evening. 11 and a half inch beard for Dave Powers from Ross Common. David's earned the title as our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Turkey Hunter of the Week. The new DNR director, David Hales, will be taking over May 1st, running the day-to-day -day operations. Now, that's a month sooner than expected. DNR wildlife biologists say that the mortality of the recently released Sichuan pheasants has been far less than expected. The birds have been spreading out, and many of them have moved a mile and a half or more. Southeast Michigan fish biologist Ron Spittler reports that they found little trace of the red band trout, a version of the rainbow stocked last year in Paint Creek. They did find in their survey work a good and healthy population of brown trout. DNR biologists will research 21 lakes in southern Michigan this summer to determine the factors that cause bluegills growth to stunt. They'll manage the lakes with different techniques to try and get the gills to grow faster. And if you think handguns are dangerous, consider this. A recent study shows that a person is two and a half times more likely to die during a medically supervised stress test than by a handgun. We're on our way to a highly successful wild turkey program in southern Michigan. The only thing that could pose a problem is people buying what are called wild turkeys from game breeders and releasing them. Now, it's illegal to do that because released tame birds pose a real threat to the populations of trapped and transplanted wild birds. Not only does the threat of spreading disease to wild flocks cause concern, but also any mating between the two can cause the genes of the wild birds to be diluted, making them less wild. The Michigan DNR has refused to plant any birds in southern Michigan anywhere near where people have released these so-called game farm wild turkeys for these reasons. A stricter enforcement of the law banning the tame birds release with heavy fines might help, coupled with the law to make all domestic turkeys flightless so they wouldn't survive in the wild. But the real solution is to let those individuals who think they're helping the turkey program know that the release of game farm turkeys is the most dangerous thing they can do in the battle to restore the wild turkey.
Here's a letter from a viewer whose question is also a suggestion. Since you reach so many outdoors persons, why don't you encourage everyone to pick up that empty shotgun shell, used fishing line, and most of all, cigarette wrappers while they enjoy the outdoors. Even on those days I fail to fill my game bag or fish cooler, I can still use it to carry out any litter I find. Well, Stephen McCausey from Mason, your suggestion is well taken, but you know, compared to how the litter used to be outdoors, we often overlook what's still there. Michigan's bottle deposit bill has had the effect of people not littering the landscape like they used to. We can be proud of that in Michigan, but like you point out, keeping Michigan beautiful is a job we can all continue to do. How many years have you been brown trout fishing yet? Oh, about 30. 30 years, how fortunate. Because you know, I've been out fishing in weather like this and have been not been fishing in weather like this. And I've always wondered, I've always wanted to talk to somebody who's been fishing for many, many years that can answer the question, how does this weather affect the fishing? Will the fish be biting across the lake? Well, if we can find some calm water, I'm sure that if their fish are in here, we, they will be hitting. So the weather does not affect the... It affects the fishermen more than it does the fish. Ed Mikula, an original Traverse City resident and longtime fisherman, is an equally good hunter. And now he's chief of the DNR's Wildlife Division. But he says that bad weather affects fishermen more than it affects fish, and that's probably true. Most anglers wouldn't know, though, because they stay in when the wind kicks up. The Coast Guard posted a small craft warning on this morning. The red flag tells boaters that Lake Michigan is rough, so the seagulls couldn't even make much headway. The break wall off Ludington gave pier fishermen a chance to be out where those big brown trout and Chinook salmon were cruising the shallows looking for alewives and smelt. And on the calm side was where we found some successful fishermen. What a stroke of luck. The weather is terrible. The wind is howling. We're coming out on the pier here at Ludington. And I'll be darned if a guy doesn't have a brown trout on. About 15 minutes he's been on there. 15 minutes he's been on? Seem like a good one? Yeah, he's been fighting quite a while. Well, heck, I'll get down here and talk with him. <laughs> we can get a little line. Looks like he has a couple nice ones here. Hey, you're on television. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> You've had him on about 15 minutes? Long enough. What is it, a king? Yeah, more than likely. You had a big brown. Are these uh, your two kings right here on no. the stringer? No. These are the guys behind me here. Ah, a couple guys. Steve Saya from Ludington was drawing quite a crowd, everyone eager to see what had been pulling so hard for so long. You now there's a lot of camaraderie and courtesy among pier fishermen. One of the nice gestures that all anglers do is pull their lines in when a nearby angler hooks a big one. And everybody's rods are standing idle now. Now that gave me a chance to see how these fellows were rigging their rods. Most had a dead smelt or alewife hooked through the back with a medium-sized short shank, medium shank hook, a, a lightweight leader, usually about six pound test, tied to a swivel and a sinker a few feet up. Some use sliding sinkers and they seem to have the best luck. And still fighting that fish for the crowd was Steve Saya leaning on his long, limber rod that was tiring the fish and giving Steve a darn good workout, too. Oh, there he is. Well, it would be a heartbreaker, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah, let's not even talk about it. No. <laughs> I mean, I've been on this fish for a half hour. Six pound line? Yep. Limber rod. Yep, it's 12 foot. Light action rod. Now your net man has is experienced. Right on front of you, Gary. Oh. Big king. This is going to be tricky. Yeah, this is tricky be because tricky. it's so easy to lose a big fish like this on the rocks. Boy, that is a nice one. Pretty fish. Big king Sam. Yeah. 
Remember, Steve is running light line, which could snap in an instant if that salmon rolled the wrong way onto the rocks. Okay, Steve, congratulations. That is one heck of a fish. Oh, that's a 25 pound. That is one of the biggest fish probably that's come off of this pier. Well, you seen a bigger one than that? No. no. <laughs> At this time of year? No. That's terrific. What's your name? Gary. Oh, yeah. Gary who? Jaeger. I hear about uh, Gary that you did pretty well yesterday. Oh, yeah. We cleaned up on him pretty good what, yesterday. How many did you get? Four. You got four. I got wow. three kings and a brown. And Steve? Why don't you pick that fish up? You want to pick that fish no, up? No, let's him off the hook. Off, up on the you, you, you don't want to monkey around out here no, on the rocks with no, this fish? No, no, Okay. <laughs> I can understand that. Well, I'll tell you. If there was ever anyone who worked hard for a salmon off a pier, it was Steve. And for an early May Chinook, this one was way above average in size. Most kings at this time of year weigh under 12 pounds. Got your scale in your pocket. Is it fairly, is it fairly accurate? Yeah, within a couple pounds. Says 20. Says 20, well, that's wrong, we know that. That's way short. That sure looks bigger than a 20 pounder. Nice fish. He sure is. Look at, he just got it. Look at that. <laughs> Half hour I've been on this fish. Oh, that... <laughs> With fish like this being landed off the pier, we sure hoped that the small craft warning flag would come down soon. More information on the subjects we cover on Michigan Outdoors can be found. We do have some fishing activity and some smelt activity around the state. We have limits up in the western UP of rainbows and browns coming into the rivers. 36 degree water temperature. It is warm enough for smelt and bait to knock. They're getting some good catches as well as perch. Ice is still around the edges of Manuskong Bay. 15 to 20 smelt for an evening's dipping at Charlevoix. They're not getting much off of uh, Alpena, Rogers City area. Even the gobblers aren't gobbling and for turkey season. 150 smelt for an evening's dipping off Oscoda. That's pretty good. And around the tip of the thumb, you can get three to four. 400 smelt running about six inches. Limits of salmon in Lower Lake Huron, limits of walleye, St. Clair River, limits of walleye, the Detroit River, uh, crappie limits around Houghton Lake in the canals. Steel heading is slow along the western part of the state. They are getting smelt off the pier at Pentwater. Coho Bob says 38 degrees is a few degrees colder than it was last year at this time. Fire hazard is high though. From day to day that changes, but some windy weather and a little warmth and that makes that a tinderbox in the outdoors. But be careful when you're out there and get outdoors this weekend if you can. It's a great place to be. See you next week. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again and all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan. Next week on Michigan Outdoors, we'll try fishing for walleye in the St. Clair River during the day. And this is going to be on Monday afternoon. If we can't catch them, we'll fish on into the evening. At any rate, you'll be joining us for this trip on Thursday night, right here on PBS. Sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow And the stillness of the forest lies encased in arctic cold The wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can It tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan Michigan Outdoors is a production of Fred Trost Outdoors Club and Outdoors Forever with grants from the Stroh Brewery Company, makers of Stroh's and Stroh Light, fire brewed for a smoother taste. Stroh's is spoken here. And Auto Owners Insurance Company for all your life, home, car, and business insurance needs. Available through your local independent auto owner's agent listed in the yellow pages under insurance. You could wheel up the ramp yourself to get into this little lakeshore uh, cabin, which, you know, is a real treat for people in wheelchairs who can't very often find accommodations up north. It's very hard. But here you found you could roll through, and the big surprise, well, not surprise, you knew it was going to be good. I but didn't know how good. Look how good, but the thing is, he did this on a cost of less than $2,000 which uh, all resort owners, people who improve facilities to make them handicapper accessible can take up to a $35,000 tax deduction. In one year. That's right. 
So he bought the, the railings, the mainly just making it a little bigger. Right. Now, everybody can benefit and enjoy a bigger bathroom. You know what's nice about this, Fred, is this isn't some big corporation. This is a little mm -hmm. guy, Al, with his resort, but he knows that folks want to travel, and he's getting ready for them. Well, we think that he is going to start a ball rolling to open up a lot of business for resort owners up north, uh, because if you can get people who use wheelchairs uh, accessible so they can get out and use Houghton Lake, use the piers, use the boats, I think that they're going to be able to enjoy not only the outdoors forever, but some of those resort owners up there, they'll be in your neck of the woods enjoying your resorts.